So let's say you're new to vintage style, or you're vintage curious, or like me, you're returning to vintage style. Where do you start? How do you go about building a vintage style wardrobe without going over budget or buying a bunch of things that don't really suit you um, and end up being a waste of time, energy, and money? Let's discuss. This video, by the way, is the first of a two-part series where I plan my own dream 1930s, 1930s style capsule wardrobe. And I am gonna share my process, which will hopefully be useful to any of you who are in a similar situation. Uh, I hope that my process can sort of shed some light and provide a framework, provide some guidance for how you can go about building a style that actually suits your personality, that feels authentic, and um, like you're dressing as you rather than what you think vintage style should look like. For myself, um, I am turning 30 at the end of the year, and I'm taking this as an opportunity to, I'm looking forward to it, by the way. I am seeing this as an opportunity to sort of really refine my style now that I'm getting older. And my process is really inspired by this book, The Lost Art of Dress, um, by Professor Linda Prevashevsky. And I love this book. It came out in 2014. And I don't think this book is referenced enough or really gets the attention that it deserves. I may review it in a separate video later in the year. But in summary, the book is really about um, the rise of a group of women, um, professional women and home economists in the late 19th century, first half of the 20th century, who um, taught women everyday women in America, how to sew and how to dress themselves and their families, both economically, but also in a, in a way that used these sort of classic principles of art. And one of the things that's really interesting about th this group of women is that not only were they professionals, they created um, their own departments in universities, but they also viewed, generally speaking, they viewed the that dressing and making clothes and fashion as like a worthy creative pursuit and something that was not in fact frivolous but very important um, almost in a, in a spiritual sense. So um, I'll link some information down below but one quote that I think really captures this view is from um, one woman, uh, Margaret Morton of the University of Nebraska, I think of the home school of, um, of, eco of economics there. And she wrote, and this is a quote from the book, she wrote that creating a wardrobe is, quote, not only proof of our understanding of design and color and texture, but also tests the real character of the person in discernment, in farsightedness, in self-discipline, and in organization and the ability to hold unswervingly to principle and purpose. So with that uh, inspiration from Margaret Morton, let's get started. Okay, so I'm going to be talking in this section about capsule wardrobes, um, just in order to sort of narrow our focus. I think focusing on capsules, it's just an easier, um, it just makes the process a little bit easier to start small. And um, for me, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be focusing on spring and summer capsule um, wardrobe, just because we're heading into that season. I'm not a big fan of those seasons. I'm much more of a winter person. So that's always been a challenge for me. And because the 1930s is my own style decade of choice, I'm gonna be basing my wardrobe framework um, on that of women in the 1930s. And the Vintage Dancer website has a really great blog post about capsule wardrobes through the 20th century up until the 60s. And according to this site, a woman who's was in a, a wealthy class position, let's say, in the 30s, would be able to purchase about 63 items per year, and that included like lingerie, sleepwear, and shoes, for instance. And a single professional woman, again, I'll put the income somewhere, would have a wardrobe of around 56 items, and again, this included lingerie, sleepwear, shoes, and these were going to be replaced pretty much as they wore out in sort of a 
almost like a minimalist framework. And the wardrobe of a working class woman would be around 27 items, and this would be a combination of uh, things that she handmade herself um, or items that were purchased over um, multiple years. And the site, sort of Vintage Dancer, specifies that this particular list for the working class woman, but the particular list that this is based off of was for a working class woman who was also married. So their husband had an income, she probably worked, worked herself. Um, so a single woman of a working class class position would presumably have even less than uh, 27 items total in her wardrobe. And Mary Brooks Pickin, who was a dress doctor, I believe, or who was, who was either part of the dress doctors who was a, a home economist, thought that, for example, the, a professional businesswoman should have four to five, quote, four to five dresses for office wear, and one afternoon dress, one evening dress, one blouse, and one skirt were, quote, all that a woman needed for her public wardrobe. So that's kind of crazy, but also an interesting challenge. Figure out, number one, figure out what colors look good on you. And I actually did um, a personal color analysis from this woman, uh, Jen Thune, Jen Thoden, Jen Thune, who actually has a YouTube channel and I'll link it somewhere here. Um, and she does um, professional color analyses. You may be familiar with like the seasonal framework of what season are you based on your coloring and certain other factors. Um, and I decided to, Jen Thuden has a bit of a different approach, but it's roughly analogous, okay? And I am glad that I took, that I did, um, that I had this analysis done, because as a result, I, it wasn't what I was expecting. I was actually surprised. I went, I've gone through most of my 20s thinking that I was or wanting to be a winter um, for some reason, I guess. I like jewel tones and I wanted to be a winter I, to, to wear these deep rich colors, but I'm actually more of an autumn, like a deep autumn. And um, in sort of Jen Thoden's framework, I am bright, warm, and deep. So I can wear bright, warm, and deep colors like this one, like this beautiful mustard yellow. And I would never have thought that I could wear something like this. Um, and I have this this physical color wheel that I can use when I'm shopping online, shopping in store, shopping for fabrics if I'm going to sew something, and I have this rough idea of what colors will look good on me and it's just a very useful, it helps to sort of narrow down your decision making. So figure out what colors look good on you, um, whether that's through uh, if you want to go bougie <laughs> like I did and do a, a personal color analysis or take different sort of color analysis quizzes or find information online, figure out what colors will actually look good with your skin tone and your coloring. Just pick your base colors. So these are sort of one to two colors that are going to be sort of neutrals or the staple colors in your wardrobe. Uh, for me, those colors are generally um, warm brown, so like a warm cognac brown and black and I guess I have sort of three, but the predominant ones are black and cr black and brown. And then also I have some cream items. So the cream is like a neutral, but also kind of an accent color. So, and for me, again, drawing on vintage style inspiration, I like to match my shoes with my bags just to kind of keep everything cohesive. So I have, as of right now, I have two, I have one black, bag that I, that's like a purse, satchel, crossbody that I will only wear with black shoes. And then I have a brown, like a cognac brown crossbody bag that I will only wear with brown shoes. And I have one cream purse that I will only wear with cream shoes. So I like to have that kind of matching color coordination because it's very vintage. And for me, it just kind of ties everything together and it helps me feel sort of put together. Sometimes I've walked out of the apartment with like a mismatched shoe and bag and it just makes me feel like a little discombobulated like I'm not cohesive in the in my presentation so for me I like I use these um, base colors as a way to match 
accessories and also match um, my outerwear. So for winter, well, for like all of my jackets or outerwear, I have black and I also have brown in roughly the same, um, as close as I can match them to be like similar shades. And also, now that we have our base colors, pick your accent colors. So for me, um, those accent colors would be a deep rich green, um, again on the warmer side of things, and then deep blues. I've been really drawn to deep blues uh, recently, so those two are stable, stable colors, as well as cream kind of being an accent, and, and I would say now with this dress, um, <laughs> mustard is also now an, an accent color in my wardrobe. Are you going to do solid color or print items, or have a mix of both? For me, I prefer solid, solid colors just because it's easier to match things with prints. I, I just don't wear them as often. I do have plans to make a print green um, 1930s style house dress for the summer, so I'm excited about that, but generally almost everything, or everything at this point anyway, um, in my wardrobe are solid colors, just because it's easier to match and I have to think <laughs> less about what to do. Um, and, and also, decide what materials you're going for. For me, right now, I'm trying to steer away from polyester. It gets very, very hot where I live. Um, in the spring and summer, it gets hot really quickly and humid. So I'm really steering clear this year of polyester or poly blend clothes as much as possible. And I'm trying to focus more on natural fibers, specifically cotton and linen. Um, this is both with items that I am going to make myself so I can breathe <laughs> in the spring and summer. And this is also has the benefit of being more historically accurate. So um, decide where are you going to wear your clothes? What does your calendar look like? Where do you go in a given month or in a given year? What are your plans? Um, what are the occasions in your life that you need to dress for, okay? And in the Lost Art of Dress, they had particular categories that had its own sort of specific clothing requirements. Um, one was school, work, being around the house, um, sports, and then um, a category that is slightly more um, unusual today, so tea or afternoon events, and then formal wear. And for me, um, my focus is going to be mainly work, housework, and I would say maybe semi-formal or, or I guess their equivalent of afternoon dress, um, which can also probably have some overlap for me with um, work. I work from home right now, I work remotely. Um, that may change this year, we'll see. Uh, you know, what's going to happen, but mainly my categories are home, work, and then sort of semi-formal wear, maybe. I think I'm covered on that, but three main categories. Athletic wear, I'm not really counting. I already have some things, so as cute as, you know, 1930s sports wear is, I don't really need that in my life right now. What kinds of pieces will make up your wardrobe? What silhouettes are you going for? Um, are you more likely to wear separates? Um, are you more likely to wear dresses? Um, what, what are the specific kinds of items that you're searching for? For me, obviously, I'm going for key elements of 1930s style, so biased cut. Um, for me, I also like things with a bit of a higher neck, just so when I'm out in the world, I just feel like everything is kind of covered and I can just be more at ease. Um, so I prefer things that are a little more on the conservative side in terms of the cut and the styling. Um, so I'm going for bias cut, jackets with um, a belt at the waist, and ideally that sort of end right at the top of the hip. And that's something that if you look at 1930s drawings, which can be a little skewed from a proportion perspective, or look at photographs, you'll see that oftentimes jackets ended right at the top of the hip and didn't really necessarily always go below that. So that's kind of the general look um, and silhouette that I'm going for. And obviously the silhouette of the 30s did change throughout the decade, but 
that's the general gist of things. And also having hemlines below the knee, either ideally mid-calf or a little bit um, higher than that, but nothing even at the knee is kind of pushing it. So ideally below the knee, I would rather keep my knees covered. That's just a personal preference. Yeah, I would also think about um, as a small wardrobe says on her channel, which I'll link below, um, style is also a whole mood. So consider too, what mood do you want to convey with your outfits? And this doesn't have to be the same necessarily throughout, but I would say there it's helpful to have a, um, a mood general like theme or consistency. That way it's easier to mix and match pieces as well. And it also narrows your decision making too. Um, yeah, anything because starting a new style or um, refining one style, returning to style, upgrading one style, it can be very overwhelming. and You can sometimes not be sure where to go and buy things that you don't end up using or don't end up fitting together. So consider the mood that you want. For me, I would say sort of tailored art deco and unfussy is kind of the mood. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking about this applying specifically with shoes. Um, and I'll have a shoe video come out, I think at the end of June, beginning end of June, somewhere in June. And I can give more examples of this, but thinking about um, the mood and also the proportions of your body and how you want things to fit and sit those are the things that I would consider. Inventory your closet, figure out what you already have and how that may or may not fit into the style and the mood that you want to create. And we can go into more detail in that uh, in the next video. I have um, a PDF checklist of steps to go through linked in the description. That way you can um, go through it at your leisure. All right, I'll see you later. Bye. I would like you all to meet one of my cats. She wants to spend some time outside. Oh, and she hears birds. Yeah, it's very exciting. This is Bronte. She wants attention. All of the time, she's a big baby. You say hello. Anyway, back to filming.